tonight um, we have uh, Dr. John Moyle to talk to us about the submarine cables in the Victorian era. Um, I think he'll give us a brief, a brief introduction to the subject and then tell us the um, interesting story about how when faults developed, how techniques developed to um, identify where across the, somewhere under the ocean the break had, or whatever had happened. And there's plenty of interesting stories there because I heard a, a version of this um, back last, um, uh, last, I think it was 20, 2015, wasn't it, I think? We had the, um, 2016 it was, yes, we had the um, Annihilating Space and Time uh, conference at which this a version of this paper was given, and very interesting it was. Um, so, Dr. Dr. Moyle, um, he actually started off uh, training as in electronic engineering, uh, having actually le just left school with with four O levels. He says, um, but having done that, he then went on to read medicine at Barts in London, uh, and spent then the next twenty four years as a consultant in. in anesthesia, uh, intensive care, and palliative medicine. Um, but he is a chartered engineer, and he's a member of the Institute of Measurement and Control, and a fellow of the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Um, and in retirement, he's, read, he's done a PhD in history of science and engineering. And uh, he comments here that uh, his PhD supervisor, who's 20 years younger than him, uh, insists on calling him Dr. Doctor. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Moyle, please tell us all about my, one of my favourite subjects because my great-great-grandfather was one of the pioneers of, unsuccessfully, pioneers of uh, submarine telegraph cables. So, uh, there you Thank are. you. Could I have the first slide, please? Lovely, thanks. Uh, first, I'll just enlarge slightly on what, my background because it is a bit strange. Um, I started. I left school with four O levels, uh, the twentieth attempt, expensive attempt, according to my father. <laughs> although uh, boarding school in those days was eighty six pounds a term, which is it's gone up a bit since then. I then went and did uh, an electronic engineering apprenticeship uh, with Mullards and drifted in the end, into Phillips Medical Systems, which, of course, Phillips owned Mullards anyway, and was an X-ray engineer. And after a bit, uh, after not very long, they wanted to promote me to management. Um, well, management in this country in electronic engineering, as you probably know, means you never see a soldering iron again. Uh, so I bolted and went and read medicine and ended up as an anaesthetist. Um, that's me there. Actually, the wife's over there somewhere. Uh, I shouldn't have been an anaesthetist because I can't do crosswords. Never could do. At least not the cryptic ones. Uh, but I did that for some years. And then on retirement, um, I went back uh, to my engineering roots when my son told me about a certain museum, uh, which was right... I love this map because it's actually meant to be that way round. Apparently, in the, in the era when this map was printed... They couldn't do landscape books. And so they were, you can see it, and right up there, Porth Kerno is right at the edge there. Uh, there's a museum there. A lot of you might have been there, at the Telegraph Museum at Porth Kerno. And you might wonder why it's in such a, a place so out of the way. Well, the main reason is that the cables used to go in and out of Falmouth. And that was a real pain. You'd think it's an easy place to, because the Telegraph landline cables, landline wires were going into Falmouth, great, a centre of um, commerce and this, that and the other. But the trouble is the anchor chains just ripped the cables up. And so they moved down to Porth Kerno, um, which, uh, if you've been, have been there, is rather beautiful. Uh, if anybody's been there, have you ever been to the Man Minac Theatre, which is an outdoor theatre, which is here, where I took this photograph from? And that's the cable hut there. And actually, when, the weather, when there's been a good storm, a lot of the cables still appear uh, above the surface and get hacked up. I can't be much left. It's all little bits that people have sawn off and taken away. 
bit further up the beach, the beach being down this side, there is uh, what was the largest cable station in the world, uh, there, uh, which uh, belonged to the Eastern Telegraph Company, uh, which ended up in the end being called Cable and Wireless. And that was opened in about 1873 and was open and working for 100 years. And these buildings are also part of the um, setup down there because, of course, lots of people were involved. Most of us live somewhere because uh, it often got cut off in the winter from uh, further back Falmouth and places like that. <coughs> so to get on with uh, talking about uh, submarine cables, uh, for those who haven't been um, in, uh, looked into submarine cables before, there's a big difference between landline, uh, which is always called wires or lines, and submarine cables. Um, with a landline system, which had been going for oh, probably 50 or more years before uh, they uh, could manage submarine cables, uh, the conductor initially was copper, but it got stolen so often um, that they ended up using iron quite successfully in the wire, which wasn't stolen so often. The insulators were, were air most of the time and porcelain or other china. Um, a little bit of rubber was used here and there, uh, but mainly it was just air and porcelain. Um, there was no electrical capacity, or virtually no electrical capacity, um, which was a big difference between landline and cables, as we'll see, uh, because cables under the sea basically end up like, a, uh, like an elongated capacitor or laden jar. Sh clean, sharp signals just sent in Morse code, up to 80 words a minute, uh, depending on the skill of the operators, some even faster than that, but routinely uh, 50, 60 words a minute. Crude and simple electrics. They used to test a lot of the time when they were sorting out landlines. Um, it was much easier, rather than getting out a galvanometer, uh, was to just lick the cable, lick the wire, and see if you felt any electricity. Nobody thought of measuring anything. So there weren't that many losses compared with those submarine cables. And no theory was necessary, really. <laughs> it either worked or it didn't. Whereas the submarine cable it always was copper. Um, it was unsuccessful until uh, gutta percha was found, which I'll come on to describe in a moment or two. As I said, it's like a, an elongated capacitor which has enormous um, electrical capacity and so it slurred the signals and they were right down initially at sort of 4 to 20 words per minute uh, before the 1990s when techniques were evolved for getting the signals out um, at faster speeds. They ended up, they realised they needed a lot of science um, and very sensitive instruments which we'll come on to. And the key uh, person was Lord Kelvin, William Thompson. Um, he was the key scientist um, in the early days of cables. Now, as I said, uh, nothing was successful until gutta percha was found. Um, it comes off a tree called the Palacrium gutta um, tree, and it's only found in a very small part of the world. Um, they tried growing it elsewhere, but it didn't grow very well. Um, as you can see, it was, it's this sort of area of uh, Borneo. A lot of it was owned by the Dutch. And for some weird reason, you'd think the Dutch would try and make money out of it once they saw um, the, the use that gutta Persia could be put to. But for some reason, it stayed on the pink side and uh, the Brits got it, grew it, um, and scraped it off and sent it back to England. And there are all sorts of wonderful stories about um, how it was how the natives there tried to get more money by diluting the gutta percha goo as it came off the trees. Anything to make it bigger and heavier, they could get more money out of it. Uh, this is the, probably the commonest picture you'll see, uh, an engraving of uh, getting gutta percha. And obviously, it reminds you um, that it, it's the same method of getting this gutta percha goo rubbery stuff as getting rubber. 
um, there's a bit of artistic license, as you can probably see, and license is the wrong word, eroticism may be, and that's why this engraving is the one that's always shown. Unfortunately, this is more accurate that they'd fell the wretched trees um, and get the bark off in that way. And you could actually get gutta percha to a lesser extent out of the leaves as well. And this it, very destructive method was used initially. And it wasn't until they realised they're going to need so much of it um, and there's such a small area of the world that they reverted to, that they went back to getting it off the trees in the same way as to get rubber off the trees. <clears throat> Gutta Persia is a slight, is, can be thought of like rubber, but it got um, some very specific properties which were very useful. One is it's uh, hard um, but not brittle uh, when the temperature is below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, <clears throat> but it becomes very plastic um, over 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it was easily moldable and much more easy to uh, make a a circular, circumferential, uh, tubular um, insulator than rubber was at the time. Um, it has a, an enormous resistivity and um, it had an extremely low coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction. And also another strange property in that its insulating properties improved as the, the cable went down and there was more and more pressure which always seems a bit bizarre to me. <clears throat> Initially, uh, when they first started laying cables with it, um, they didn't put any armouring on it at all, and it was just no, what we would now call the core. In other words, it was copper wire uh, with a surrounding of this um, insulating material, the cut of Persia. Um, there's another talk I can give sometime about the manufacture of the cable um, and the laying of it. Uh, but basically, um, initially, it was just gutta percha on wire and they had to put weights along it to get, get it up to stay on the bottom. And this was real blue sky stuff. It had never been done before, never been dreamt of before. And for some years, it was always that way. So it always amazed me how they managed to raise money uh, to, get, um, to progress the thing when it was so unsuccessful to start with. So the first one that was laid uh, was a failure. Um, one of the reasons it failed was that a French fisherman hauled some up um, by mistake and cut a chunk out of it. And he got this black thing with the copper down the middle and he took it down the pub um, in France and told his mates that he found a snake with gold down the middle. Um, that didn't help, uh, so they all... At, uh, Armouring was needed straight away, <clears throat> and also a lot of publicity. So the first one was a failure. Then they had some success with these reasonably short lengths um, across uh, the English Channel. So they thought, well, what we really want is to get it across to the New World. Um, and so the, the number of attempts at laying Atlantic cables, and it was a failure. Um, the following year, it worked for a few for a little while. Um, how they managed to get the money, which was in, enormous amounts of money to do this, um, how they managed to get it a year later when the first one was a complete failure and it had never been heard of before, uh, goodness only knows. So that, that was not a success. Then there was the Red Sea debacle. Um, more than getting connecting to, the, to North America, we were much more interested in those days in connecting um, to the jewel in the crown, which, of course, was India. And, in fact, uh, to get um, to a cable to India, all you really needed to do, the only undersea bit, uh, was um, across the channel. Uh, so, and they'd been reasonably successful with that. And then, from then on, um, it could go overland all the way across to India. Um, they realised that um, this was not entirely safe um, because it had to go through a lot of enemy territory on the way and you couldn't send any secrets down the line and all sorts of things uh, went wrong with doing it. And, but initially um, it reduced getting a letter from London to India 
from several, some months down to about six days, and it improved steadily after then. <coughs> but what they really wanted to do was to get, it, get the cable right the way across to India, not going through enemy, in inverted commas, te uh, territory. And the big, <laughs> they were reasonably successful uh, to start with, uh, getting it across, uh, down from, um, from the UK, uh, down to uh, Carcavelas, which is near Lisbon, down to um, Gibraltar, Gibraltar to Malta, Malta to Alexandria. And then by whatever method, they got at some stage to go down the Red Sea. <clears throat> and this is where the government caught a very large cold um, because they told, they gave the uh, company that was laying it a good contract uh, that lasted uh, for some years, some 10 or 20 years, whatever happened. And they stupidly said, we, what we'll do is we'll give you a bonus if you don't use as much cable as you thought you were going to do. And that was a disaster um, because they hadn't surveyed the Red Sea very well and it is full of coral mountains. And they ended up, and because they wanted to use as little cable as possible, they stretched the cable from peak to peak. They didn't realise they were doing this. And, of course, it kept failing all over the place. And so it was, in fact, a disaster financially for the government. But then there was the Committee of Inquiry um, set up by the government, the Board of Trade, which basically was to decide whether or not one should carry on spending these vast sums of money on cables. <coughs> Um, and it, it was, a, a, in fact, a very good committee. There were all sorts of things that uh, one could complain about it, um, and they did. But the <coughs> thing that clearly came out of it, even though it was, and it was government um, who set this up, was that this could be a very successful uh, way of uh, getting signals across this, uh, large uh, areas of sea. But what it depended on was doing all the things that they were doing at the moment as far as um, making the cable, protecting it and laying it, but they've got to do it a lot more carefully and set up a lots and lots and lots of standards and things like that. And it changed the industry from being rather amateurish into being something that was very scientific, and it actually worked. At the same time, uh, the British Association for the Advancement of Science formulated um, a papers about electrical standards of units, especially the unit of resistance, which was going to be the most important thing in <coughs> setting up these cables and also in maintaining them. And after that, in 1865, when they had improved all these things that were suggested by the, uh, the Board of Inquiry, 1865 cable was nearly successful. And how on earth they did it, I don't know, but a year later, they got an enormous sum of money uh, to repeat the performance, and it was successful, and they even managed to complete the cable from the year before. And from then on, um, it was... Well, I was going to say it was plain sailing, but it wasn't really. Uh, but the interesting thing is, of course, that the Brits completely ruled this. Um, all the science, all the engineering uh, came from the UK. And the cables um, were like this, and they changed very little uh, between the 1860s, 1870s, and the 1930s, when polyethylene became available as um, an insulator, rather than using these, uh, um, uh, the gutta percha. And what they consisted of, basically, was the core, uh, which, um, as far as um, the cable industry was concerned, it was in, done in two parts. They made the core, which was uh, the copper conductor and the gutta percha. And that was made in a lot of factories um, around the country. And a lot of them were in Birmingham, because Birmingham was the centre of the wire industry. Uh, but they had to, um, instead of making copper wire, which was look nice, um, which is what copper wire was mainly used for in those days, um, it had to be of an electrical standard. And, of course, a lot of the people who were involved in uh, manufacturing copper didn't know anything about electrical properties of wire at the time. 
Uh, so that it was all a new thing to them. And it was coated in gutta percha by the wire manufacturers. And that was the core, and that was sent down mainly uh, to factories um, on the Thames near Greenwich. And there were some in other parts of the country, but mainly there uh, to have this armouring put on the outside, um, which uh, was done... It was done at the coast so that it could be loaded straight into ships. And the, the brass tape was wound round there uh, for protection uh, from animals, which I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, then it was jute, um, wire armouring, more compound of tape and jute and uh, tar, tar-like materials, um, served in different directions until you ended up with a, a thing like this. I'll pass it round, but I would love to have it back, please. <laughs> if you'd like to have a look at it, um, you'll see it's, it's put together from those things uh, that I've, I've mentioned here. The two brass rings on it, just to keep what, it intact. What, how do they make this gutta percha? Sorry? Do they have to cook it? To oh, yeah, it? yes. Yeah. Um, we haven't got time today to go into how it's actually put together and, and laid on. Um, but that piece of cable that's going round, I drew the short straw when I started lecturing for them in that I got that piece, which is a shore end. Um, if you get a, a piece which comes from the deep ocean, <laughs> it's half the size and half the weight. Uh, this is, these are the, that sort that's going round at the moment. Basically, the, at the shore ends, the cable had to be much stronger, much heavier, and it liked that piece. Um, because of uh, the, the rough ground, the rocks that it was on, uh, tidal currents, um, other currents, um, protection from fishing nets and uh, anchor chains and all the rest of it. However, as, it's, as you go off the um, continental shelves down to the deep ocean, um, you can get right the way down so that at the deepest parts, um, the cable was only half the size. And the reason is, of course, that anchor chains don't go there, fishing um, uh, tackle doesn't go there, and there are no currents. And you know, basically, for most of the ocean, it's just lying on, on um, ooze, as it was called, sort of sand and um, stuff from um, shells and all the rest of it, which had, were down in a sort of powdery state. And there were no currents to move it around, so it didn't get chafed. So... Um, it doesn't all, that's the, the piece of cable that's going around is very definitely a, a shore end. Now the differences um, in the operating techniques uh, between landline and um, the cable, uh, submarine cables are sort of shown on here. <clears throat> this is landline telegraphy where you have a straightforward Morse key or um, you could end up with a bug, a semi-automatic bug key, but whatever, it was done by hand, um, dots, dashes, straight standard Morse code. The sounder was the thing that was at the other end, uh, so that if, the, uh, if you were sending Morse by landline, um, it was not like the Morse that everybody thinks of, da 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 that sort of thing. It was click-click for a dot and click-click for a dash. Uh, so it was... It was just from this uh, armature being banged up and down. Much more difficult than uh, hearing it when it's coming out of a, a radio where you, you deliberately hear the dots and the dashes. Um, otherwise, uh, they use, sometimes use these, uh, which is a Morse inker, uh, which is basically a, a roll of tape, which was under the box in here. It uh, was drawn up and through there uh, by a... Uh, clockwork mechanism, this is where you wound it up. And here is the equivalent of this bit. And it actually marked on the paper in dots and dashes, so it could be read, um, so that you didn't have to uh, have somebody listening all the time. You could switch this on. There's a galvanometer at the back there, and there you can see there's a Morse key on there. <coughs> Submarine telegraphy, much different, much weaker signals, um, they used a thing called a cable key, which I'll come to in a moment, um, and the signal at the other end uh, was very, very much weaker, and you couldn't use a sounder for it. You couldn't even hear it on earphones. 
and they used a device called a mirror speaking galvanometer. Uh, mirror galvanometers had been developed some years before, but um, William Thompson developed, uh, it, developed it slightly for use uh, with uh, cable, submarine cable telegraphy. Um, what you have here is a, a scale. Um, there was an oil lamp behind there projecting through there onto a mirror on here, which is a very tiny mirror um, suspended on the hair. Um, and the light was reflected back there. So the very, very small current, the problem was being able to detect these very small currents. Well, the very small current could move this tiny mirror, which was um, supported by a hair and a little magnet on the back of the mirror from here. And so you could get the signal would move that way or that way across. The scale was about this big. Of course, it moves slowly because of the uh, capacity of the cable. A few years later, um, when, you, when you're using this, um, it takes one person staring at this scale uh, at, while another person is writing down what the guy is saying who's watching it on the scale, which, of course, would be very difficult. Uh, for A, it would be a dot and a dash. Well, it, the dot would go this way and the dash would go that way. Uh, but it might only go a, an inch or two, and also it used to drift for reasons we'll uh, come across uh, a bit later on. About 1867, uh, he developed this thing called a siphon recorder, uh, which was brilliant because it didn't need two operators concentrating hard at it at the same time. Um, basically... Um, Oh, this is the Morse key that they used, um, and you can see it's got two keys. And the reason is that instead of doing a dot and a dash uh, like you would do with normal Morse, um, one, for one of them, you pressed the dot, uh, which sent a positive signal or a negative signal, and the dash with the other one. So they used to do it like this. It was very difficult because normally when you send Morse code, you can hear, you get feedback yourself, what's happening. With cable, you don't. You do not know how... But they, they worked out what speed they could do it at, but the chap who was sending it got no indication whether he was going too slow or too fast, apart from his own training. And they used a thing called cable code rather than Morse code. It was Morse code, but um, when you send uh, Morse... Normally, for example, an A, um, well, that would be, is a dot and a dash. Um, so you get a dot, and the dash is three times as long, and the letter space is, is like, so it's like that. Cable code, you don't. The elements are all the same length, but in two different polarities. So for an A, it would be like that, and for, uh, for the dot, and like that for the dash. So it was a completely different method, a way of sending uh, Morse code. And the problem was that the longer the cable, the bigger the capacitance, and the worse, the more it got slurred. Uh, for example, if you look at this, this one here, um, a lot, it's this uh, five is just five dots in a row, uh, five dots in a row. Um, and here... If it was being sent by a very short cable with low capacitance, um, it, it's quite clear. But if it was medium length, it's getting more and more blurred. And if it's a very long cable, like crossing the Atlantic or even worse, the Pacific, it, you could hardly see them at all. If this, this is an L, which is a dot, a dash, and two dots. Um, it's the, it's got the same problem. So the short cable, um, it's easy because you can see the difference between... You can see there that there are two dots and the one dash. And, but as it gets longer and longer cable, um, it gets more and more blurred out. But if you can see, um, it may... OK, there were two... If that was one dot. If you sent two dots, it would actually come up to a higher amplitude overall. No. No, not on the transatlantic, because 
it was way before uh, repeaters were available. They didn't come in until uh, the 1900s, um, 1920 even. Um, this is a siphon recorder, um, much enlarged. This is one at Porth Conan Museum. And you can see the paper tape there drawn through here. Um, and it was a very cunning contraption, um, which I don't want to spend too much time on. But the basic principle was um, a moving coil here between, in a powerful magnetic field um, with a, held with a fine... Um, fibres. These two weights here kept it in the central position. The problem was you wanted no friction because the signal was so small. So the cunning way they did it was that um, this was the connection from as that, this would move, this, this coil would move, um, it would wiggle this thing here, which was a fine um, um, siphon a fine capillary tube coming from a pot of ink here down, and the, the paper would come along here, and this would wiggle across here. But the pen was not in contact with the paper um, because that would induce friction. Uh, so what you had this thing here, which they called a mouse motor for obvious uh, reasons. You know, the poor little mouse isn't in there. It's driven by electricity. So there was an electrostatic current induced through here, down here, there was a metal plate behind there which would draw the ink through and the paper would uh, be driven on down that way and you can see the trace being uh, put on out there. That's the sort of trace that you would see. Um, as you can see, um, an A, there's a dot and a dash, but um, we haven't got time to, to go right the way through it. But you can see that it would make it much easier than staring for hours on end at those little dots. Now, to get on to the, the problems, um, the, one of the things is that they, anybody who's done any research or written any papers or written books, and there are plenty of them around now, about the history of cables, um, very few of them were written by anybody with any scientific or engineering background at all. And so there were lots and lots of them. Um, and the problem was that they seem to think, uh, because that's what they were led to believe by the companies, that once you laid a cable, it lasted for 50 years and nothing went wrong with it. Um, and they, they worked very hard to make sure it stayed that way. There were, in fact, some which actually um, were slightly more honest. And this is the sort of Bible of submarine telegraphs written in um, 1898. And it does mention um, fault finding in it. Uh, but nothing um, out of all the books, there are so many books now, and nothing written uh, about the reliability uh, of the cables. Now, in that last book um, that was mentioned, there is this curve uh, which shows that this is the longevity of cables, uh, submarine cables, in years. And they, wor they worked for 50 to 60 to 70 even um, years after they were laid. Um, the, 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 it's distorted afterwards because they were um, more and more improvements in cables and wars and all sorts meant that some of the cables were taken out of use uh, when they still got some life in them. But the problem was that the people who were writing this literature, um, there was he thought there wasn't much evidence. But if it was an engineer you went ferreting around, you could actually find, it, find some. Um, it's difficult and it's patchy to find out what the reliability was. Um, and from as far as the operating companies were concerned, there was a lot of commercial secrecy. Um, and why should they archive it? They weren't interested in historians in the future. And it probably got, a lot of it got shredded. And a lot of it they kept quiet about and kept secret. Um, because if it, the people realised how unreliable cables actually were, um, they wouldn't be so keen on carrying on laying more and using them. But if you go ferreting for the evidence, it's there. <coughs> the first... A lot of it is so obvious, too. Um, Haig wrote some wonderful book, which went to two editions... 
uh, called Cable Ships and, uh, and Cables. And he lists every cable ship there was. Now, if there was, um, and, and which company they worked for and what they did, if there were the number of cable ships around that were in there, in his book, then there'd be one cable ship per cable that was laid. So it was quite obvious that a lot of these cable ships were not for laying cables, but for repairing them. <clears throat> Other evidence, um, which I found at um, Porthcurno, uh, the Eastern Telegraph uh, books, um, minute books, are all stored there. Um, and fortunately, uh, John Pender, um, who put a lot of, an awful lot of money, he was a cotton magnate, into um, cables um, and ran the company. And he was always interested in what his ships were doing. And so every month um, in the minute books, he says which cables are being repaired and how long and what for. Uh, so I put together a spreadsheet which had about, oh, it was about 5,000 lines in it of cables, uh, cable work by the various companies and various other sources that I found it from. Um, the Eastern, uh, a lot of the uh, repair work was done by another company, which in the end was part of the Eastern Group, and that was the uh, Telcon. Um, and their in company engineers' logbooks um, are in the National Maritime Museum, and I got it in there at, down at Greenwich. The Eastern Telegraph Company initially uh, was formed from these four companies, so. It, and every time somebody thought of laying a new cable, they laid that cable, um, but with the, and it was the same people from Eastern Telegraph who were doing it, but they set it up as a separate company each time because they, it, was, um, it might fail financially. They didn't want to take the, others, uh, the rest of the company down. And then when um, the cable was successful, uh, he added on more, and there were about 20 cable companies in the end. Uh, belonging to them. The professional press uh, is another source of the information, um, but as you can see, the electrician and the electrical review, uh, guess who the proprietors were? Um, he was uh, part, uh, he was on the board of Eastern Telegraph. He actually laid uh, the cables uh, across the Atlantic as well um, on the Great Eastern. And the proprietor of this one uh, was the chairman of ETC. So how honest they were, goodness knows. An interesting feature, um, I also looked at the Times um, to see what the general public knew about what was going on. And uh, the Times is this grey one here. Um, and reporting malfunction in the Times almost disappeared altogether. And the reason for this was that they laid lots of duplicate cables so that quite often um, a cable would go down and they could shove all the um, data that was going through that cable to another cable and the general public don't, wouldn't know about it at all. Um, otherwise, uh, this one here uh, was the stuff I found in the electrician who reported it weekly, what was going on. Uh, but overall, it was a lot of cable uh, failures which I found which were hidden from... Uh, both forms of the press. Another thing that which um, the, the authors of the books, history books, missed out upon are the fact that there were all these textbooks about how to repair cables, um, which I wouldn't have thought you would miss um, if you were an engineer. Um, but as I said, it wasn't engineers who were writing the history. <clears throat> what it boils down to um, is if we look at the repairs by ETC, um, the total, if the, the green line shows the total in nautical miles that the company had laid, and the other graph, the red graph, shows the malfunctions. And if you look, there's actually a little change in the area or improvement in the reliability of the cables over the period I looked at, which was the Elizabethan. Uh, which was the uh, Victorian era. And a lot of those ups and downs, I thought, what in heck was that were they all about? Were they to do with war? But no, you, you're not expected to read all those, but those are all, shows how belligerent a nation we were, and we were at war virtually continuously during the whole period. Um, so it's obviously some sort of statistical thing, not enough data, um, that there are those rows and falls. 
which basically uh, works out at about approximately uh, one to two cable repair voyages being required for every 500 nautical miles of cable. So they weren't very reliable at all. <clears throat> now, uh, the, what caused the, f the failures? Uh, first one has to um, come up with this horrible word called malfunction. Uh, malfunction, uh, you can't say the cable was faulty because it had a specific meaning in that era. An interrupted or broken cable, the, there was, it, it was it. There was, the copper was cut um, by whatever had happened under the sea and there was no communication. But a fault meant something completely different. The, co the co copper conductor was still intact and the cable would operate, but it had leaks um, in uh, the insulation, which meant higher sending currents, weaker signals, slower signaling rate, um, and its efficiency depended on how much damage there was. Uh, the causes of malfunction, two of them were expected um, initially. There were guessed that it would happen. Foul fouling by anchors and fishing gear and underwater earthquakes and volcanoes. But what, there were a lot more uh, that came up and that I found. Defective manufacture, uh, proper in, uh, improper storage before they were laid. Um, this was often storing in sunshine. And if you've got uh, cables uh, it laid in uh, coils with the sun beaming on them, the gutta percha heated up and melted, and the core, the copper core, became eccentric uh, insulation. Lots of other things, insufficient, uh, defective joints. Uh, the jointing was uh, something that was a very great skill, jointing the cables. Um, insufficient surveying, so they didn't know where the mountains and troughs were um, under the a sea. Uh, chafing from currents, fish bites, lightning strikes, not at the cables, but at the cable ends, uh, which led to uh, holes being blasted in the gutta percha. Um, lack of slack, uh, with a deep cable they had to lay at least 20% extra and with a shallow cable 10% extra uh, to allow for the undulations under, under the sea and also uh, so that you could pull the cable up to repair it if necessary. A malevolence, it did happen and submarine boring animals um, were a complete menace um, and the, the biggest of these boring animals was called the Torado Navalis and he's the little fella uh, who ate the bottom of wooden ships um, hence it's often called ship worm even though it wasn't a worm it got the name cable borer as well and it, in the far east it was called tamilok and tamilok was deep fried uh, <laughs> Torado Navalis which shows just about the size of the it, they weren't actually worms, they were sort of bivalves, but they were a complete menace. And this was one of the reasons uh, for the addition of that copper, of the brass tape, because he couldn't get his little choppers through the brass tape. He wanted, the, he wanted to eat the gutta percha, uh, which was in the middle. But the brass tape, which cost a lot of money, uh, stopped him. That's the origin of copper bottomed, the phrase copper bottom, because he could put copper bottoms on the bottom of the wooden ships. <coughs> Um, and uh, they didn't keep sinking uh, because of that. So when a malfunction occurred, um, the first thing to do was to reroute the signal, um, whether it, you've got to decide whether there's fault or break, test for location, find the nearest ship, cable stocks, where were they? They had stored them all around the world, but sometimes had to make new cables. And then it had to affect repairs, and all this uh, had to be hidden uh, from the general public. Um, not just the general public either, governments as well. Measure, the way you found the fault was a measurement of electrical resistance. Initially, um, it was by substitution tests, uh, just comparing the resistance between um, the cable and a, a resistance box, which had been calibrated in nautical miles. Uh, the cables were just a single core and the earth return uh, was the salty water. Um, and more and more tests were developed uh, because they wanted to get more and more accurate 
uh, position, location of the fault uh, to repair it. <coughs> so it just a uh, substitution test to start with Wheatstone's Bridge, which had been around for some time, 19, 1843, Wheatstone took it. Um, it was originally 1833 by somebody whose name escapes me, but they started doing null tests against much more and more accurate uh, resistance bridges uh, to, to calculate where the fault was. And finally, there was Wheatstone Bridge doing a null test but with calibrated uh, milliameters, which came in, um, in about the 1890s. Um, that's the resistance substitution uh, patent uh, from Bright, and that's what it actually is. And they just compared um, the, from a resistance box uh, against cable itself um, and they're looking at the galvanometer um, and quoting it in divisions and when they got it to being equivalent to the same they could read off uh, approximately where the fault was. Uh, well they needed to know exactly in ohms where it was to work it out uh, where the fault was. You're not going to be able to read this it just shows how many by 1871 how many different schemes of resistance there were um, available. Um, an, an enormous number. Uh, but this was later reduced um, by the cable companies who were the people who wanted to know most accurately resistance uh, to True Arm, Legal Arm, the British Association Arm and Siemens Arm. And they're not very far apart. But um, they, what you needed to know was exactly where we, to, to as few um, uh, significant figures as possible, as many significant figures as possible, where the fault was. Um, and so you look, you'll see on the charts, um, if you look at the charts, that they actually have um, written down the resistance and the uh, Eastern Telegraph Company, even up until the 1970s, were using the BAOM. Uh, because that's what the original cable uh, values were measured in. Uh, if you want to read about the history of uh, the resistance, there's a very good paper, Ohm is where the art is. Uh, and it, it, it's very good. Bruce Hunt's a uh, history of science uh, professor in the States. What do they use today? Sorry? What do they use today? Well, they don't, because it's fiber optic now. <laughs> Uh, but you come across diagrams like this in the textbooks, which are horrendous for us to understand, and you realise in the end that it is actually just um, a Wheatstone Bridge. Um, one of the things about the Wheatstone Bridge that they do use uh, commonly was that you had to reverse the battery voltage, and they used a special key to do that, which looks like that, looks like a couple of Morse keys, uh, but it was so that you could swap the polarity of the testing current. Uh, by 1925, there were all of these tests available, both, most of them based on bridge uh, circuits, but why on earth were there so many? Well, the reason was that the cable um, was... It could be thought of in this way up here, that it was approximately 10 ohms per nautical mile and 0.35 microfarads per nautical mile. But that wasn't um, exactly what was going on. Simplified, um, looking at um, the arrival curves of the current, which was shown in the last graph, which is, I didn't ex explain because it's so awful. Uh, this chap, Frank Sky, unfortunately has redrawn the thing completely. And you can see what happens here. If you have uh, a current which you're switching on and off, um, at the other end, if it's 100 nautical miles uh, in length, approximately North Sea-ish, um, you would get that shaped signal. And um, that point there would be at about six seconds. Um, uh, it would be about five milliseconds. Uh, 2,000 miles, which is approximately the Atlantic, is two seconds. And approximately across um, the Pacific, it's six seconds. Um, so it's, it's so difficult to measure because everything would be drifting the whole time. 
And if you look at an equivalent circuit of um, one of these cables, and if you imagine that the cable, th this bit here appears in mirror image this way, and this is where the brake is, what you've got here is that resistance I mentioned, which is you thought would easily find you where the fault is, of 10 ohms per nautical mile, um, with a capacitance uh, here, which makes it um, drift up and down so slowly. But it's worse than that. Um, it's much more complicated than that, uh, because you've got an earth current the whole time, um, so depending on the state of the moon and all the rest of it. Um, the C return changes its resistance slightly. Uh, the dielectric resistance, of the, in other words, the leakage of that capacitor there changes. And worst of all is this thing here, which is a cell, an electrical cell, battery, if you like, um, formed from the copper, the brine, and the iron cable, uh, the iron sheath. And that's about 0.3 volts. And all those things screw up any measurement you're trying to make of the resistance. Also, um, I mentioned that you reverse the voltage uh, when you're making these tests, these resistance tests. Um, the problem is that it changes the whole time. Uh, of course, of the Earth as well. But over here, um, as you change uh, the polarity, so the resistance changes, let alone from that as well. Um, if you pass a current uh, through a faulty cable, uh, pass it in one way, when you first measure it at one moment, you'll get the, the best result, um, which is, a, a, we'll say, at time naught. But very quickly, uh, if you've got the positive side connected to the line, um, you get cuprous chloride deposition on the end of it, and so the resistance goes up. And if you reverse it, it also goes up by tiny hydrogen bubbles forming as well uh, to increase the resistance. The sort of test bed that they use um, is like so. Uh, this is the one at Porthcurno, and this bed was made uh, in about 1880 and has changed very little since. Uh, this bit here had been improved. This bit here is the galvanometer, and that was made in 1888, was still being used in 1970. And that's, you can see the scale um, that it was, would uh, be measuring along the... And here was one of the uh, ammeters stuck on the end of it, uh, which was the, the sort of latest stage. There was a number of tests which I won't go through, but they were all combinations of things using uh, a Wheatstone bridge. Um, and the more complicated they made the tests, the nearer and nearer they got to the actual value of the fault. And as an example, this is a cable that went from Lisbon down to Pernambuco, which I couldn't find on a map, a modern map, uh, because it's now called Recife. <laughs> uh, but the fracture... It was a fracture, was about here, along a length which was about 1,800 nautical miles. <clears throat> uh, so it was there, as you can see, there, it was over um, a, rock, a mountainous area in which they didn't actually know about at the time. Um, the information about the, that I found, and I use this as examples because there was a lot of information about this particular fault, in all sorts of sources. Um, initially, the problem was to, to find, having got the resistance uh, where you say so you could calculate uh, where, the, where it was uh, along the cable on the chart, um, you then had to try and find it. Um, and at the time, um, the passage charts, as they were called, were very crude. You have navigational charts which are drawn um, around. Uh, land masses so that ships don't hit them, but the deep ocean had, they were called um, a passage chart, and they were very inaccurate. And a half mil pencil line represented about one and a half kilometres on them. Um, there was only dead reckoning, 
uh, the accuracy of compasses was not good. Astro uh, navigation was pretty good, uh, but it's still within um, a maximum accuracy of 0.1 minute of arc. Um, bathymetric navigation, the accuracy of soundings was done by weights on the end of a piece of string um, in, in the time when this uh, actually occurred, this fault actually occurred. But they found it within four nautical miles. They then had to grapple it. Um, they pulled, they actually used the, the one that's on this side here with these teeth um, to haul the cable up. And what you had to do is haul the cable up, find out whether the fault was there, uh, whether you'd gone past it or not. So you had to cut the cable, do the measurements in both directions, put them back together again, and sink it down again. And they did this, but it was so deep um, that they actually uh, had trouble hauling them up. It was 2,000 fathoms. And when they tried to pull it up to even measure it, it snapped. Um, and so what they did in the end was they pulled it up uh, a bit and put a buoy on it and then went and pulled up the rest of it. So it had, there was less strain on here. Because you have to remember that the cable had a tremendous weight trying to pull itself back down to the bottom. And they used a dynamometer to discover what was happening. But once they hauled it up, they cut it, and if they were lucky and found the fault in exactly the right place, the two ends of the cable uh, were attached to this uh, cable jointing rig. Um, and then a very skilled workmanship to put the cable, put the new piece of in in. Um, and cover it and recover it with gutter percha and recover it with all the uh, linings to protect it. Um, and putting in all those wire, those steel wires again. Very skilled job because once it had been thrown overboard, it would cost the earth to get it back up, find it and get it back up again. And that's uh, the position that it was on the chart. The original cable, on the original chart shows this cable here. And this bit, they had two different measurements from each end and couldn't work out why. And the reason was um, that there were two breaks. Um, and it was probably because of a volcano or an earthquake, uh, a submarine earthquake. And they had to put in that length of 83. They, they use the word knots wrongly in a lot of places. Uh, they're using it there as nautical mile, which they also used as, they used the word naught. N A U T, knots. Uh, of course, nautical mile uh, knots is one nautical mile per hour, so it's it's the wrong usage. And this is I put put it on a modern chart, which shows how much better the modern charts are. And of course, since then, um, since the cables that uh, there's a lighthouse there now, not far away, but that's where this piece of cable was put in. So in summary, for a major break like that, there was a delay caused by lawyers and all sorts of things because the cable at the time was not owned by one of the major companies. Uh, they had to manufacture spare cable. Um, the Thames Estuary to uh, St Vincent um, uh, was 11 days, um, and the cable ship, it was put on the cable ship, it took 11 days to get to the site. Um, and it was on the ground, as they call it, where the fault was by the 16th, it's another week later, uh, 18, da 18 days and 18 hours in that area, 28 dredges, cable hooked 15 times, boys put down, picked up 13 times, 35 soundings taken, 48 nautical miles of cable used. Uh, it was very expensive, took a very long time, and as you can see, it wasn't going again until the 4th of December, yet it did, never appeared in the Times in London uh, because they were managing to use other cables to other routes. Well, I think I've, I've talked enough about um, the basic things about cables and how expensive they were to repair. It would be another talk, another time to uh, talk about the manufacture of the cables, how they actually laid them. Any questions? <laughs> right. Ooh, as, back. as usual, um, there's the opportunity for questions now. Um, the, there is a roving microphone 
There's two roving microphones. Uh, I would be very grateful if you could get hold of one before you start asking questions. Um, just to warn you, we are, as usual, trying to video this uh, lecture. Uh, and it, if it, we get a successful recording, it may in due course appear on YouTube. So if you don't wish to be known to be here, then keep, keep quiet at this point. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, So uh, I think we've got one, one there. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Very interesting talk. Um, I was thinking, when these chaps were out bobbing up and down and say, trying to find the cable, get, getting it, fixing it, once they've done that job, how did they know that it was working? And how would the information be transmitted to them to say, yeah, it's working now? Because um, once you pull the cable up, um, on board the ship... There was a cable station, a miniature cable station, and one of those test boards, just like the one at Porth Kerno. And they could converse with either end. Um, usually, in, the, in this case, only one end could they talk to. Um, they, when they were coming down from um, uh, some, from St Vincent's, they could still, when they pulled the cable up, they would cut it and talk to St Vincent's. Um, cable station to say, you know, is the signal good here? And then they'd look at the other end. Uh, hopefully, they could contact the other end, but they couldn't at all. Uh, so what they had to do was um, put a buoy it, um, put a, a new piece of cable on, and go off down a bit further. And they'd have to pull it up two or three times until they found out where it was. And each time they pulled it up, they cut it. And never listen. Um, and of course, because there was a, a fault further on, uh, when they brought, pulled it up again, um, when they cut it, they found that they could still couldn't talk to Pernambuco, but they could still talk to St Vincent on the French fresh piece of cable they were unwinding from the ship. And it went on like that until when they picked it up, they could converse with Pernambuco. And then they joined the two ends together. Mm. Can I ask a bit more then? Yeah. So they've got the two ends connected. How do they then know for absolute certainty that that was speaking to that? Uh, once they joined the two bit, they got signals from both ends, joined them together, and did them up, and then they had no idea. <laughs> they didn't have radio at all. But it just shows how important the skill was of the guys who were actually putting it together. Uh, because if they'd uh, joined it, they, they were a, a group on their own, specialists. Um, they join it and toss it into the ocean. And, of course, if it didn't work, um, they wouldn't know, and they'd have to voyage back to find out what had gone wrong. So they couldn't, basically. But they, they should know, because they could talk to both ends when they got to that point. And they just hoped that when they joined them together, nothing changed. Thanks a lot. There's another one just behind there. Got a supplementary on that I'll one. I'll do the one up top in a... In a uh, let's take the one at the top first and then... Uh. Um, one of the comments you made was the ships were cop copper-bottomed. Yeah. I don't know if you know that uh, copper was poisonous to marine life and, in fact, any ship that contained a metal with copper in it was always clean mm. so it never had any drag mm. um, but the other thing I really wanted to say was I remember very very vividly Telstar when they did that first communication across the Atlantic from that point on I presume that uh, cables then started to be used less and less compared to using uh, satellites? A couple of things. First, um, about the copper bottom. The, one of the interesting features is that um, when they build hospitals now, the water piping is all copper and is not plastic because there's far less um, transmitted bacteria through copper pipe than there is through plastic. Now, the interesting thing about cables and satellites... Um, the cables uh, ruled the, uh, the world until wireless. And then they, the cable companies got very worried 
um, but it was still found that cables were more reliable form of communication than uh, for wireless. Wireless is brilliant for things that are mobile, but from fixed point to point, cables, they breathe a sigh of relief because the business didn't go down. Uh, then we got to the stage where the satellites put up and the cables, it did go down a bit. But um, there were all sorts of interesting points about that. There's Goon Hilly, of course, which um, was one of the major satellite stations. If you go to Bude, there's um, a station called uh, at Morwenstow, which is owned by... Um, people in Cheltenham that we shouldn't really mention, I suppose, GCHQ. But what people didn't realise was if you look where the dishes at Goon Hilly were pointing um, and you went up to Mormon, the dishes were pointing exactly the same place, so they were spying on everything that was going on. But now it's gone the other way. Fibre optic cables are cheap to lay and very, very fast, and you can get a lot of stuff through them. They're also very secure, um, much more secure than satellites. And GCHQ said, oh, bugger, because they can't get into um, the optical cables. Um, you could, actually, if it was a copper cable, you can lay another cable next to it and pick up induced currents. But you can't do that with a fibre optic cable. But what we've ended up with now is that fibre optic cables are taking most of the traffic from the satellites and the satellite traffic par excellence is good when one of the stations is moving so it's brilliant for news it's brilliant for ships it's brilliant for aircraft it's brilliant for people who are walking across the, um, the pole and all the rest of it but from point to point it's fibre optics that are now taking over because they might, for point to point, because they're so cheap to lay and also carry, can carry even more traffic uh, than a satellite can. Have I answered the question? You have. Uh, one thing as well is in hospitals, if they would only make the door handles out of brass, <laughs> all of these terrible diseases <laughs> will never be carried through a hospital. And they don't seem to have learnt that one yet. Uh, they haven't, but on the other hand, um, it, 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 they're not absolutely perfect. If you put um, a filthy hand covered in bacteria on a doorknob, whatever it's made of, and somebody touches it within a few seconds, um, copper or plastic, it's still going to transfer. <laughs> I've been there and tried it. <laughs> I've done that bit. <laughs> Right, yes, there's one, one on, on my right. I've got two, two points. One on your um, cable repair situation, the, the, the question from in front of me. Um, surely when they'd um, finally connected the copper core together, mm. couldn't they have talked to both ends from the, from the station on the ship and thus proven it before they then before the, insulated yeah. and, and, and then dropped the cable over the side? Yeah, the problem was that that cable... Um, that I mentioned was broken in two places and it's happened fairly um, commonly with big eruptions under the ocean yeah. um, especially uh, I'm get, having got bored now um, because I finished a PhD I'm looking to <laughs> one area and that is um, where we now know about tectonic plates I'm trying to relate how where the uh, damage to cables occur because we know it's happened recently um, in the Far East. Uh, the internet was put out of action in the Far East for months on end because um, of a large earthquake cut hundreds of cables, uh, fibre optic cables. Um, but I thought I could waste some more time um, looking <laughs> at the historical side of that. Um, the other one, with your signals being between, <laughs> I, I, I believe from memory, um, let's say five to 12 seconds in duration. Yep. Is there any record of um, interference of those signals by things like telluric current, which, which can induce um, uh, signals of that sort of time frequency 
um, onto, certainly onto pipelines, and I guess onto cables, particularly near the landfalls. Yeah, the, the main, uh, they, they used to refer to as earth currents, yeah. um, and mainly they're diurnal and fairly slow in comparison with the signals. Well, they're tidally driven. Um, they, well, well, tidal and, and, and moon. Yeah, all yes. sorts of things, yeah. but they were mainly slow. So what they managed to do is to put a capacitor at each end, um, which uh, of, of a value such that the fairly comparatively fast uh, code could go through, and yet they, the diurnal variations would uh, be cut out, would be eliminated. But no records of things like tellurics, which are much faster causing problems? No. Interesting. David? Having been lucky enough on to, to have travelled across the Atlantic twice on freighters and therefore being able to look at the charts as we go and see where all the cables are, have you any, there's two questions, or <clears throat> two bits and pieces. One is, all the modern cables are more or less parallel. When did the, they stop wobbling them? Because the first one I saw on a chart wobbles all over the place and crisscrosses, goodness knows what, and back again. Any idea when they had the bright idea of making them parallel to make it easier to pick them up? Uh, I think they were trying to the whole time, but they didn't. Couldn't, well, the first one out. certainly doesn't. Yeah, the earlier ones, um, they weren't that. Their navigational skills weren't that great. Yeah. Uh, but now they could, the, the trouble is now they're laying them almost in bundles, yeah. and the latest thing is that the Russians could uh, slice them because uh, we did. We sliced them very well in First World War and the Second World War, uh, which. Um, well, there's all sorts of interesting history about the Zimmerman telegram and things. Certainly uh, at the, in the 40s when all the colonies of the European powers were gaining their independence, one of the problems with the cables was they all went back to the home country uh, and adjacent uh, places which are now freely governing republics couldn't communicate each to each. They had to go back to Europe from one capital to another and then back out again. Uh, and that was a big problem. Well, in the, in the Victorian era, we owned most of the cables. Yeah, <laughs> but there was also the French system as well as ours. And yeah. That sort of thing. But uh, going back to your other thing about uh, anchors, I noticed uh, coming into Mar Marseille, there's for about two or three kilometres out of Marseille. The whole area is marked, do not anchor here because of mm. submarine telegraph. Mm. There's one over there. Yep. Thank you. Um, yes, <laughs> picking up on a, a couple of... I don't think you're switched on. Sorry? Is it switched on? <laughs> Right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, thank you. Picking up on, on two points, you, you were saying uh, about um, uh, use of cable cutting. Uh, as I understand it, most of the German cables uh, were cut by one o'clock in the morning after war had been declared at midnight in, in August 1914. Yep. Uh, and as you said, all the cable companies uh, were British, so th the intelligence was, was good. Um, you were talking about parallel cables. Uh, at what stage did it become realised or recognised, if ever, that it was actually more economic to drop two cables at the same time uh, in that the cost of, of taking the ship out and the cost of the cable uh, must have converged at some stage? Or, or did it never they, they, as far as I know, it was certainly in the Victorian era, they never laid two at the same time uh, because they realised that um, whatever damage could happen to a deep-sea cable, which is more likely to be earthquake or, or volcano, if the cables were too close together, you could wipe out um, both cables at the same time. 
So they tried to have them at a distance apart, uh, which is easy enough to do in the Victorian era because their um, navigation wasn't quite as good as ours is now. Um, and there are evidences of um, a uh, big volcano, a big um, landslide occurring in the North Atlantic. So I can't remember when it was. Newfoundland, 1929. When it took out three cables, and it, and it was an hour between yeah. each as this thing rolled along. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I worked for an American company in the uh, early 1980s and they provided a database service and in order to get that to our UK and European customers we rented bandwidth on a cable and uh, at one point we suffered a, a fairly short service break and we were told it was because of a shark attack in shallow water mm. and we were further told, I didn't really understand it at the time, there was something about the cable, whether it was smell or an emission of some electrical current that actually provoked the shark. Mm. Is that possibly true? Yeah, I've got, in the PhD thesis I wrote, I managed to find some um, diagrams of how sharks got tangled up in the cables. And it happened more often um, than one would expect. And as you say, it's probably due to a uh, change in magnetic field around the cable. There's a bloke called Bruce Heason. I think he's written several papers on it. He died in the 60s, 1960s. Thank you. Um, but in the thesis, I've got some diagrams that he drew. Of uh, They often found uh, animals' teeth in the cables when they did pull them up, uh, where, 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 the, where there was a fault, because they hadn't actually broken uh, the copper. But um, they had to bring the cable up because the insulation had gone. They had a tooth in it. <laughs> Well, um, yes, at the back there. The early transatlantic cable layers presumably knew little about the topography of the seabed across the Atlantic. Yeah. So there was did they have an em empirical method of la the amount of cable they laid out? Well, they did. Um, they surveyed. They learned very soon. They got to survey uh, the, the routes that they were going to take. Um, but, of course, they had to do it by letting down... It was piano wire they used, actually, another piece of string, as I mentioned. A, a, a device right down to the bottom, to a proper sounding. It also sounded the bottom. It brought, brought up a, help, you know, a handful of whatever it was going to, uh, yeah. whatever the, the bed was. But to do that in the deep ocean, it would take two hours, two or three hours, to let the thing down. Um, and, of course, it got more and more inaccurate as it went down because you were weighing the cable as, as well as the... They were weighing the wire as well as the weight on the end of it. So they, they were obviously, they did it oh, 10, 15, 20 miles apart. And they missed all sorts of things. And that's one of the reasons that they lay, the deeper they were, the more slack they laid. But they, there was marked on a lot of the charts the telegraphic plateau in the North um, Atlantic. Um, and we've since proved since um, that it, there isn't one. It's got lots of great holes in it. Um, a colleague of mine, Alan Green, um, who's also researches down at Porth Conner, he managed to get um, from one of the uh, big cable, one of the big surveying companies, a chart along the route of the cable, um, which showed. With, which is continuous. It's all, it was done with um, you know, sonar. And uh, he's compared it with the original chart uh, where it was sounded every 10 miles or so, every 10 nautical miles. And it missed great, great um, holes. And one of the first, uh, first Atlantic cables broke at some point, and they thought it was a mechanical... You know, they couldn't work out why it broke. It just snapped. Uh, but Alan Green has managed to show that it broke exactly where there is a great can, um, cavern uh, in the ocean bottom when it was measured absolutely continuously by uh, sonar methods. The Atlantic's still opening up, isn't it? It's, well, they're all on a move. It's yeah. about 10 centimetres a year. Um, it, yeah, it's, a, it's said to be about the speed at which your hair grows. Well, not yeah. mine, mine grows <laughs> anymore. But, um, Just very briefly, you, you were... There's a museum in Cornwall which I've not heard of that I'd like to visit. It's 
It's Forth, the Porth Kerner Museum. Oh, yeah, it's, it's called the Telegraph Museum. Um, it's well advertised, um, but if you can't find it, um, go put um, Google Minac Theatre, M-I-N-A-K Theatre, and it's about 100 yards away. <laughs> And that's the theatre cut into the rock, uh, where they do uh, plays, very well-known theatre. And it's just a couple of hundred yards away from that. Um, it's open on uh, the weekends and Mondays during the winter, uh, but every day during the summer. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. When was the last actual uh, cable laid, like the copper, you know, those, uh, copper cable? No, it's, it's not working. Just hold it nearer to, nearer to you. When was the last cables laid before they went over to fibre optic? Um, in the, not quite sure. It was about 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. The, big t the biggest change happened in the 1930s when they changed from gutta percha to um, plastic insulation, polyethylene insulation. Mm. Um, fibre optics experimentally was about 30 years ago crossing the Atlantic, but now it's just backwards and forwards all the time. And how do they uh, know to the breaks in those? How do they know where they are? Ah, they, um, they use a reflectometer method, optical reflectometer method, which is similar to sonar, really, um, in that you send a, a pulse of laser light down uh, the fibre and it will reflect back where there's a fault and you measure the time it takes uh, to, to travel there. Um, so, in fact, it's much simpler to do. In fact, it's not quite necessarily as accurate um, in, in mileage. Um, but it's, it's a lot easier to, to pull up a fibre optic cable and repair it as well. Thank you. But they, even, even in, they use that reflectometer method um, with, yeah, sign, uh, with high frequency signals, um, even in the copper era yeah. um, towards the end, as soon as the oscilloscopes came along. Any more? Silence. I think, I think we have finally, finally covered this one. So um, it's uh, been fascinating. As I said, I have a personal interest in this because my great great grandfather was a one of the pioneers in um, uh, trying. He tried to produce a lightweight cable. It's a thing of sort of metal, uh, <laughs> steel, you know, iron. Uh, uh, rope formed around it. He tried to just use an ordinary hemp rope to stop the weight, of, the weight of it, drag, because of the. They have to be very strong to carry the weight of them down into the deep ocean. So having a lightweight one that didn't have to support its own weight, but of course the the marine worms uh, at the, uh, at, at, the at the rope. Yeah. <laughs> so the only one I think he he got a contract from the French to try and put a cable in, but it but his his one to the Isles of Scilly had. Had failed before that, can say. So they withdrew the withdrew the contract, and uh, it went to a more conventional one. But uh, but it's uh, it's an interesting subject, and um, so uh, uh, so anyway. So I've I've thoroughly enjoyed enjoyed this, and uh, I'm sure the rest of us uh, have and certainly covered a lot of interesting uh, material there. So so let's express our thanks in the usual way. <laughs> Thank you. No, with details of uh, February's meeting and so on, I should just see if Jim Renahan can fill us in on those sort of things. Hello. So Wednesday the 7th of February at 7pm, Plastics by Dr Susan Mossman. Um, uh, Susan is a curator at the Science Museum in London and her specialist research is into the history of plastics um, from Parkazine through to Bakelite. So that's the, um, the, the, the sort of material that she'll be um, talking to us next month. And I'm interested to hear about the 1930s and plastic um, forms of plastic being used uh, on, the, on the cables. So we might be able to put some questions to Susan around that. See if you can tell us about nat natural plastics like gutta 